Hey guys, welcome back. I've got a second time around guest, Chris Prefontaine with Smart Real Estate Coach. And uh, I'm super pumped to have him here because I don't normally bring people back on the show. But what I thought about right now is the economy, the market, especially commercial real estate market being in the level of distress that it is, as well as where it's going. You know, Chris is very well positioned to educate our listeners on how to take advantage of some creative financing. So Chris, thanks a lot for coming back, man. I appreciate it. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's about a year. Uh, it, it has been over a year. Yeah, no, I look forward to diving in because things have changed obviously since then, but that's the nature of the biz, right? Absolutely. I think we dove pretty deep into the change of markets and market cycles last time. So, hey guys, if you haven't listened to the previous interview with Chris, make sure to jump back and watch that or listen to that so that you can hear what we talked about before. We're not going to overlap. Um, we're going to get into some real nitty gritty on the how to's and the what to do's to take advantage of this upcoming market crash that I anticipate with commercial real estate specifically. So um, pretty cool. Now, Chris, just a refresher, you you do a lot of creative financing. Maybe you could just quickly tell everybody what you do and kind of what your niche focus is in real estate. Yeah, we buy any asset class and we focus on um, the fr free and clear in particular for owner financing. We focus on sub two existing financing. Great right now with rates the way they were. And we focus on lease purchase on some properties. The first two are our favorite strategies and probably best for most people right now frankly. Yeah. And really, you know, especially in mobile home parks, which is what I have a heavy concentration in my portfolio, I have a little bit of self-storage too. A lot of the sellers that we're buying from are free and clear. So let's yeah. like dive right into this. Why are we looking at free and clear properties and what are some angles to work with that? Yeah. Um, free and clear. We love it's by far my favorite here. Here are a couple of high points. Why? I can always, always get them to their price. And usually if they're free and clear, I don't know, I'll call it ego, whatever you want to call it. They want their price, period. They're in a good spot. So I don't mind giving them that as long as we can get our term, you know, long enough time. Why? Most of my deals are structured principal only payments or if they're over a million, so you have imputed stuff that kicks in or a combination of, hey, let's go 18 months or 24 months principal only then take the balance and amortize it. That's pretty powerful too. I don't care what you're looking at for a property, you know, for an asset class. Yeah. You just said something that is actually the opposite of what I hear most investors talking about. You said principal only, not interest only. You said right. principal only. Why principal only versus interest only? Picture the, um, I use my building. I always use this as an example, but I bought this building. I sold it two months ago, but I bought this building and I said to the owner, I want to do principal only payments. That's how we structure most of our deals. Now, the why, before I talk about that conversation, is the 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 hammering down of principal and the recession hedge, I'll call it, is amazing. Picture it. So this building, he said to me, principal only. Like this guy owned, he was one of the largest landowners on the island here, Three Town Island. I said, uh, yeah. And then he was shocked. But what we ended up doing is a, what I call a hybrid, which is great for anyone to hear. We took 18 months. You could take longer. He wouldn't go more than 18 months. And we did principal only. And then we amortized the balance at like 5.2. At the time, that was a touch high, but not too shabby right now. Not too shabby at all right now. Yeah. And so basically, you just used some words that I want to point out. You said, yeah, the way we structure most of our deals is just principal only. Is that what you actually say to them? Or is it a little bit less direct about the principal only and versus interest and things like that? Actually, good question. I assumptively talk in the conversation like we're going to establish a price, then we're going to make you monthly payments against that price. If the word interest comes up, yes, I say this, this is how we structure most of the deals. If they say why, I say, well, what's more important to you? Now, you can. this can be a CSAR or a quadrant or more. Let me explain. What's more important to you, Mr. or Mrs. Seller? Is it price? Is it down or is it interest? Now you could go, is it price? Is it term? Is it monthly? And leave interest out, right? And leave down payment out. So you could have a quadrant or you could have three things. And so I say to them very honestly, look, those are the things, what's most important to you? Because I can't give you all three. That wouldn't be a win-win, right? Let's right. wait for their agreement. That's no, that's fair. And then they pick their best, that you know, their priority. Usually it's price. Sometimes it's monthly and sometimes it's, well, I can't go more than five years. So sometimes it's term, but mostly it's price. Yeah. And so you're giving them options, right? You're not just saying, how do you want it? 
you're actually giving them choices, which is important, right? And then additionally, you're getting them to see that there's only so many levers. And that's kind of what I tell sellers. When I talk to sellers about seller financing, I usually tell them that there's a few different levers we can pull. If you want this lever pulled, then we need to pull this one back. And it's just exactly. adjusting on a spreadsheet to get to a win-win between the two of us, but it's never going to be all four levers pushed forward. It's got to be right. one or the other being manipulated to make sure that it's a win-win for both. You said a, real, a key word, you said spreadsheet. Now, if you're speaking to a seller, words like that, or I ran our metrics and if I do this, I have to do this. That's less of you, they think, right? Perception, less of you just throwing numbers out negotiating than I ran it through my formulas. I ran it through my metrics. I put it on our spreadsheet here's how it would work or here's how it could work way less wiggle room there or at least it appears takes the it takes the weight of the decision off of the person that they're talking to we also use appraisers and banks and other sophisticated investors yeah. as the excuse to why value needs to be what it is it's like hey if any appraiser or any bank looks at this they're going to value it this way. And we have some challenges in the mobile home park space with valuation that we use that on to make sure that they're not thinking, hey, Mario's just being cheap. No, somebody else on the outside is going to be the determining factor of value, not me. That's super powerful, Mario, that you bring that up because then you can pull yourself on their side of the table with this comp stuff, right? With the comparables, with the appraisals. And that's what I do. So, so they have some wacky number. I say, look, I'm on your side. I'm on your team. What's going to happen is, same as you said, if an appraiser comes in, now you're going to waste three months or six months and this thing's going to die. We don't want that to happen. So let's talk about how we can make it work. Yeah, uh, this is powerful as far as discussion. Because it's only worth what it's worth. And yep. they have to realize that it's just because they want something doesn't mean that it's worth that. And anybody in their right mind or sophisticated investor is not going to pay more than the property's worth. Now, can you maybe talk about how you've used some of your creative financing structures to get closer or get to a seller's number, even if it was a little bit higher than maybe what an appraisal would come out to? But how did you make sense of giving them their price? Because you said price, yeah. terms, whatever. Um, how did you make that work? A couple of things. This is where you can circle back and go, look, I'm I'm sort of your only buyer at this price if it's too high. And, and let's be let's be real, let's be realistic here. If they say, okay, and they they're tracking with you, now this is where you kick in the principal only. So the only way I can justify it is two ways. One, I gotta make principal payments against that for a certain amount of time to justify your price. Now in my brain, I'm going, I don't want to go more than like six to 12 months to get the amount of principal paid to get down to where the value is, right? Um, now, if I have 20 years to do that, like this year I did this building and rather I did 20 years. So if I have 20 years to do that, I'm okay maybe going up to 12 months or 18 months in my brain to get the appraisal number down. Now, you and I both know over 10 years, I, I really don't care what happens. 20 years, I definitely don't care what happens because you're going to hammer it down. So principal only is the answer to that, in my opinion, um, or you can tier it. Um, tier If you play with the math, and this is pretty powerful. Say you go two years principal only, then you go a year, 2.5. It's it's not, the number's not as important as you work in the math on this. Then go, you know, 3.2. They see they're getting interest and it's tiered up, but you're hammering principal down still. Pretty yeah. powerful yeah. method there too. Yeah, that's crucial because you're not just talking about taking it from one interest rate and bringing it up. You're talking about going from no interest to a little bit of interest and a little bit more interest, but you're... Right. You're, yeah, I, I like that. And you're also taking into consideration your principal pay down that's much higher in year one than it normally would be. And then using that to offset the value that you or the price that you paid for the property. And if you can get it down to where it needs to be within the first six months, a year, whatever you said, you know, you're back to where you were already. And, and it starts to make a lot more sense after okay, that because yeah. you keep paying down principal. Yeah. So I love that. How, when you're talking to these owners, I'm going to word something in a way that I know is incorrect, but how do you get these sellers to want to sell to you or sell to you as seller financing? Yeah. This is the biggest question we get, right? How do you convince them is what I hear how all do you the time. Convince them, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think of it. Think of this. This will help you on the phone for the listeners. Like if you get on the phone and you have one mindset and that mindset is, ah, you know, I'm just looking for people to help today. 
And then you picture yourself as no different than an accountant, uh, auto body shop, dentist, lawyer, pick one. They're not trying to convince you of anything. They're going to either solve a problem for you or help you accomplish a goal you couldn't otherwise accomplish. Okay. So on the real estate side, it's no different. The gentleman who was selling this building, was he hurting financially? Nope. I never solved that problem at all. He had a tax and estate planning plan in mind that warranted owner financing. That's So that's why he did it. So I didn't convince him of anything. He wanted it. So listen to, the, to what they want. Like if it's overpriced and they're dead set on that and they will sell if they get that price and you get your term, you solve their problem, you got your way. Um, if they're financially in this market, if they're financially hurting, then you can solve. Again, you're just looking to solve, not convince. You'll come at it differently because you're not selling or convincing ever, ever, ever. You're solving problems or helping them accomplish a goal. A word comes to mind, and that's the word motivation. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about how to determine what this seller's motivation for selling is? Yeah, here's so here's a simple thing, again, with any asset class. Why are you selling? Like, Picture this, you your neighbor puts their building up for sale or their house, doesn't matter what asset class. And you go out and you go, hey, Mario, what? Well, how come you're selling? Oh, really? Where are you, where are you going? Or, you know, are you going to buy another building? Yeah, well, so what if it doesn't sell? Boom, you just got, with those three questions, like what if it doesn't sell? You just got the motivation because what if it doesn't sell? Well, I'll just take it off, I'll keep it. Uh, what if it doesn't sell? I'll just lower the price and blow it out. What if it doesn't sell? No, I got to sell it by this date because I'm going to do something else or whatever. So those questions, where, when, why, what if it doesn't? Those are great questions for any asset class, script-wise. Have you ever figured out how to force a seller to be motivated? No, not, not yet. If you figure that one out, let me know. Yeah. I think, too, a lot of times people underestimate the power of the volume and going through a lot of no's to find a yes. We think that we want, we think that we need to get on the phone talk to three owners and one of those owners is going to want to sell at a price that we want to buy at. But what we, what a lot of times people don't realize is that the people like yourself, myself, others that are doing a lot of deals, they're talking to a lot of owners and we're getting a lot of no's because we know we can't convince that seller to transact. We can't make them motivated. We're just searching for the ones that have real motivation and then working out a deal that's a win-win for both. Would you agree? Oh yeah, hundred percent. So what came to mind when you said that you're spot on, what came to mind is know your numbers, right? I don't care what business you're in. I don't care what asset class you're in. Again, this is generic stuff here that's super powerful. And that is when you pick up the phone, you need to know how many dials you did that week. You need to know how many you contacted live and you need to know how many turned into a lead. And the lead is someone, in my opinion, how we teach our community is a lead is someone that didn't tell you to get lost and it's not sold yet, right? So, because over time things change, especially in this market, stay in touch. Um, I'll give you an example. I know in a, in a particular asset class that we teach a, a section of our community, it takes somewhere between 11 and 17 leads, people that already sort of said from a VA call, hey, I'm interested to get in the door. It takes somewhere between 17 and 25 to get on a contract. And it takes roughly 40 of those leads that I speak with to um, have, a, have a property actually get turned around with us. So just know your numbers. If your numbers are worse, okay, just know them. If your numbers are better, okay, just know them. And until then, borrow someone else's who's been in the biz. That's all. Like you, you do a bunch of calls. Just let Mario share the numbers with you. Boom. For sure. Are you used? You mentioned that a lot of the students, or even maybe yourself, are using VAs to tee up the calls. Can you talk about how that structure looks and how you guys basically start to finish up that pipeline? Yeah. Yeah. So we use different services depending on what list you want to pull. Like if I were a listener now, I'd love to go after the free and clear property list in any asset class you have. So say you pulled that list. Then yes, we have a VA call, virtual assistant call that list. If they're again, even remotely open and they're still selling, that is a lead slip that comes to us. And then we call it. Um, so they're looking for what? Things that didn't sell and already closed. I'm sorry, they sold, already closed out. Things that just aren't a lead. After that, we call it. If it becomes a deal in our community, they bring it right up to the coaches, myself at the higher level or other, other coaches, and then they set the deal structure. Got it. So there's there's a, a filtration process there. It sounds like you're not only getting skip trace lists, but then you're having a VA call first to weed out all the no's and yeah. everybody who's clearly not looking to sell. 
And then when it when they say, yes, I'd be interested in selling, that then gets turned into a lead sheet, which then gets pursued by the investor. And then they obviously have you look at it as a coach. Yep. Yep. Spot on. And then there are some that, that one of two things. There are some that still keep their finger on the pulse. I think it's a good idea when you're new to do some first calls, you know, call ones we call, to just stay fresh and you'll be able to train your VA. And, and then there are others that say, okay, my VA can do this much. I'm going to get on a power dial and bang on a bunch more calls too. So there's, there's different concoctions of that. But yeah, I'd say that if you plot me in any market right now, Mario, I'm going to hire a VA. I'm going to probably hire a part-time executive assistant. I'm going to just get after the phones, you know. Any specific service that you recommend for VA hires? Uh, we have a company, I can't even think of their name. There's a bunch on our site, but we have a company yeah. that we used to train a bunch of VAs and became, why are we doing this? This is not our world. So we turned it back to them. The guy's name is David, but I, don't, I can get you the info. And he has all creative real estate type VAs trained. Yeah. And so you just talked about something that's, I think, important is you recognized where your skill set is best used and where it's not. And recruiting and training VAs can be a major headache. I always teach you know, my students to hire VAs that have already done skip tracing before. Don't bring on a virtual assistant and then try and teach them how to skip trace. Make sure that they do it the same way that you know is the correct way in their interviewing process but they should have already been doing something for a long time. And it sounds like you, even when you have, have VAs calling, they're experienced real estate specialized VAs that have called before. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel and educate all these you know, VAs to figure out who's good and who's not. No, I agree. Uh, because they'll, too many investors will look for the cheapest deal and they're starting from scratch. <laughs> when you call this service, or the other one just came to mind, Riva Global. He was uh, the one was an ex-hockey player. That's why I remembered it, that name. But again, they're on our site. They, you call them. Do I suggest you do as a team player would get on weekly touch base and other things with them to keep training them? Sure. But they, they've got a base. They know what the heck they're talking about. They're not calling to flip a house or, you know, they know what the heck they're doing with creative enough to get in the door. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about with where you've seen new investors in any asset class? What was the mindset? or maybe some consistent things that you saw in students that got started and had quicker results than others. Yep. This is huge. Cause we have people that do a deal in 30 days and 15 months and everything in between. And it's mindset. Um, in no particular order, Mario, things come to mind like one managing expectations. If they come into the, the community, I don't care what community, right? And I don't care what asset class. If they come in going, okay, I'm in it for a long haul. I'm not in it for a quick fix. I don't need to do a deal tomorrow like I need water. I'm, this is a, a, a three-year trial period for me, if you, if you want to call it that. Then they'll have success on that front because it's not a try in real estate. and It's not a get rich quick tomorrow. It's a, I'm going to commit to this. I researched it. I'm going to get after it. That's one. Two is I can't imagine uh, not hiring a coach, first of all, but I can't imagine hiring a coach and then not listening to him because this happens. So someone does a deal and then they go off sideways because they think they got to figure it out and they mess things up and it will become stagnant. So a coach that's where you want to be. So that's not brain science, right? Very simple. So managing expectations, a coach or someone, mentor, that is where you want to be. Um, I think the other thing would be when we, you enter the space being vulnerable to your mentor or coach. Because if you have baggage, like I did coming out of the crash, for example, you need to work with that or that's going to get in your way. And I know this sounds like totally not real estate. It's 100% real estate. And it gets in the way. For sure. Yeah, I, I've seen the same. I mean, some people get started and they're like, yeah, I want to close a mobile home park deal in my first 60 days. And I'm going, well, the due diligence period is 60 to 90. So <laughs> unless you've Whoa. got something all teed up and under a contract and ready to go, it's just not realistic. And then I think when they do that, when they have that mindset of it's got to happen today, then when it doesn't, then they feel let down, they get distracted and they chase the next shiny object. Or if they have realistic timelines, hey, I'm going to get my first deal in the first six, nine, 12 months, whatever, then they're working towards it up to that point without feeling like they've already lost. And right. so, yeah, I think I think you're right that that early that accurate expectations is huge. I was talking to a, to somebody the other day and I said, you know, how many different 
property type strategies have you chased in the last couple of years? And they're like, four. Well, <laughs> you've chased mobile home parks, storage, you know, subject to all this, you know, all these different strategies and different property types taking all this different coaching. Now, the best thing is, is that they're very knowledgeable about all the angles. And I said, look, this is it. You're either going to do this or you're never going to do anything in real estate again because you're committed and it's over. Like chasing yeah, all different property well. types is over. And uh, I think it's important to kind of have that burn the bridge mentality getting into any um, investment. Learn it, do it till you're good at it, and then look at other things if you want to do that, but get good at it. So let, let me ask you this. Is there... Is there a certain thing that a seller says to you when they're when you're talking to them that just tells you, you know what, I'm not going to make this deal happen with this seller? We talked about finding motivations, but what are some things that you hear the sellers say that tells you I'm wasting my time with this seller? Yeah, could be say or could be attitude, quite frankly. So what I mean by that is, okay, go back to the seesaw or the quadrant. If, the, if I'm throwing variables at them and they just honor at the beginning saying, no, I no, I want all those. I think I can get all those. I'm, I'm, I may call them in 60 or 90 days to see that they did stumble and fall or that they did get realistic, but I'm not, I'm probably not going to. Um, it's worth always one follow-up because things change in real estate, right? Over time. For sure. Um, that comes to mind. Uh, when I say how they act and that's important because I would hope everyone's in this mode. You don't have to deal with anyone you don't want to deal with. And if the deal starts off where you're getting the 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 queasies over it, or you're just getting this gut feeling, why go forward? You know what I mean? There's just some attitude sometimes with with, with these sellers, um, and I don't want to deal with that. If they're hard then, or they're hard to deal with then, or anything like that comes up, then it's just not worth it. And you're going to be married to them if you're if they're carrying the paper, I mean, right? So yeah. do you really want to deal with a jerk for the 30 days, let alone for 20 years? Yeah, it doesn't matter you know, how like, good the deal is. Yeah, <laughs> it's not worth it. You know, a lot of times sellers, I'm sorry, a lot of times buyers seem desperate when they're yeah. talking to owners. How can buyers talk to sellers and not sound desperate about, you know, seller financing, wanting to buy their property, being creative? Because I think a lot of times buyers will be like, I need you to carry the paper. And it tells the seller that you need me to finance this because you're not qualified. Yeah. Um, this is scripting. What That sort of screams at me. Um, it's not what you say. It's 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 important to learn that, but it's how you say it. It's the confidence. So if I if I'm coming across like that, like needy, it doesn't matter how good my line is. It's it's going to sound needy and not confident. So so two things. Uh, role play. This is not every professional role plays in some shape, form, or fashion. But realtor realtors or investors or commercial investors get in. They they think oh, I can just pick up the phone. No, you probably should role play and practice scripts. I did in every, every niche I went into, I did. So, and then you can come across confident. Um, when I say role play, I'm talking, get a partner and role play live. That's what I, that's what we tell our students to do. That makes sense? Absolutely. No you know, and you keep talking about education, students and all that. And what I want people to realize is that guys like Chris, guys like myself and others, a lot of the people that you've heard on the show, I'd say all, if not most of the people that you've heard on the show are big into the education space, both as many cases now they're educators, but in their career, they've been students and I'm an ongoing student. I'm in multiple courses right now and yeah. coaching programs within different niches because I want to get really good. And the fastest way for me to do that is to learn from a Chris, to learn from someone who's already been doing it, like he said, and is already where you want to be. And then basically save a ton of time. A lot of times people look at the cost. They go, oh, it's going to cost me 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, whatever it is to get to do this. But you could do that or you could spend three years trying to figure it out yourself and bang your head and potentially go bankrupt to making the mistake. Or sadly lose on a deal. And that is painful because that'll flush you right out of the business. Then There's you're completely more painful. out. <laughs> yeah. how, how do you think about uh, education and what do you say when somebody says, well, I don't know, seems like a lot of money to, you know, to learn how to flip homes or to, in this case, get seller financing and things. Yeah. Um, I always say relative to what they say expensive because they say it's expensive before they figure out what the return could be. There's a missing link there. Why do I say that? Picture this. Let's go back to the conference thing. If you and I were, were absolutely certain that if we did a, 
We did it would lead to B, we did B lead to C, and it was that predictable in our brain. It's confidence. Doesn't matter what the cost was if we knew the return was really good. We would why? Because we'd go find it. When I was coming out of the crash in uh, 08, so this is probably like 10, there was a program I wanted to be in. I had zero money and zero credit. I called and by the fifth call, got an attorney friend that I went to college with, and I said to him, Look, you front the money. It was 25 grand. It wasn't like it was no money. At that time, that was everything to me. I said, you front it. I'll give you, I forget what the percentage was. I think it was a third of my profits until you're a hundred percent return on your money. hundred percent return. How would anyone say no to that? So that's how we did it. Now that, why did I do that? Cause I knew that if I follow the coach, I would have the result that he told me I'd have, right? That's all it is. So you, if you approach it like that, you'll get resourceful. So that was a long answer to say, find out the return for us. Yeah. And when you say find out the return, you're really saying look at it as an investment, not an expense. 100%. Yeah, you know, 100%. and 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 obviously look for the ROI. Yeah, I think now anytime I'm going to do something new, I always look for the person who's already where I want to be in that space, and I pay them. It's just worth it, you know. And my wife and I have had some conversations. She's like, "You're spending what? Yeah, like, yeah, but." It's going to take me probably 90 days to get up to speed on what I what I need to do and how to immediately implement something from this guy. Or I can take who knows how long and maybe never figure it out. And 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 so it's just a different mindset. As you figure out that that's the way to really scale up and and, and grow your business efficiently, you look at it as just hiring consultants for whatever you need improvement on. And, and I think it's super valuable. Hey guys, real quick, if you want to invest in mobile home parks and you want coaching and education and hands-on partnership in the mobile home park space specifically, go to getrealcashflow.com and check out exactly how we can help you. Now, Chris, let's talk about subject to financing. I know subject to has been has gotten very, very popular, especially leading into the higher interest rates and everything. Yeah. But can you just explain how a subject to transaction works and the benefits of taking advantage of that? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, subject to just means subject to the existing financing in place. So if any of you have bought any asset, let's say you bought your own home, on the settlement statement, there was a line that listed the mortgage you took out to purchase that home. And that's how that settlement sheet got balanced out. So let's just say you took out a $300,000 loan. It said from X bank. When you buy subject to, so I buy Mario's house, subject to. Now, opposite of owner financing, free and clear, this is usually lends itself to someone who does need some relief of some sort, just for the avatar. Um, so I buy Mario's home, and on the settlement statement, because the loan is staying in his name as guarantor, not me, the property is going to transfer it on the settlement statement. Instead of new money, it just says subject to existing loan with X bank. That's it. So, so I continue to make payments on Mario's behalf. I own the asset. And he stays on as the guarantor as far as the bank is concerned. Now, why is that so cool right now? Because every week in our community, we're seeing properties come in at like two and a half to five and a half percent interest rates. And I don't know when we're going to see that again. So this is a very cool strategy right about now uh, on any asset class because of the past interest rates. And you can even search, go find interest rates on properties bought between, I don't know, 19 and 22 or 19, yeah, 19 and 22. And also further search with little equity. So then you get someone that either can't sell because they can't pay a commission or they can't sell because the market dough or they can't sell because they got to move quickly. You're in. It's a perfect solution. Yeah, I love that. And what's the downside? Because I know there's a lot of sophisticated investors listening to this. Obviously, there's a due, in, due on sale clause in most mortgages. Yep. How do you navigate that? How do you think about that? Is it just a risk that you're taking that you're comfortable with? Or how do you how do you look at that due on sale clause? Yeah, and so explain be, what it is too for those. Yeah, who don't. due on sale in in almost every loan to your point just states when the property transfer is the loan is due. Let's keep it basic. And please, I'm not an accountant or an attorney. I'm just gonna give sure. you what we do, right, guys? So in like 82-ish, whatever year it was, it was around then, the Garmin St. Germain Act was passed that allowed families and this people to move property, not trigger the due on sale because they were doing it for estate planning reasons. Okay. With that as a backdrop, again, I'm not an attorney. What our attorney has us do is we place all the properties like this in a trust. The trust is labeled the Mario 123 Jump Street Family Trust. 
so that it appears on record that that's what's going on for, for estate planning. Again, that's what we do. You need to chat with an attorney that does thousands of these. They'll tell you the best way in your particular area. Um, number two, remember the bank doesn't want to own property. The only time I see investors getting screwed up on this to, in my 32 plus years is when they stop paying or don't pay on time. Yeah. You, you're asking for a headache. You, they just want to be paid on time. And so in my personal career, we've never had a, a bank do that. Now, we did have an attorney for one of our students in Philly about three years ago say to him, and I don't know how valid it was, but he said to him, hey, there are some local banks here cracking down and looking for transfers. Why don't we just do a contract for deed or otherwise known as a land contract? So there's other ways around it. My point is, this could be a two-hour discussion. My point is, get with an attorney that does them. And quick story on that. I We had a, a, a student that went away to Israel, and he was panicky because he had to get an attorney in his area. It's Jersey, New Jersey. I said, don't worry, but I'll find one. I called four attorneys, Mario, and four attorneys in that state told me you can't do that. This is this is why you have to get a good attorney. I finally found one, and now we use them on all deals. They're in 32 states. They did it in like eight days. That's like calling a divorce attorney to say, what should I do to stop my business, right? You got to get the attorney that just does those, and they're out there. Yeah, you really need someone that you don't have to educate. They should be educating you, no way, not the other be. way around. It's yeah. kind of like when we call banks about you know financing mobile home parks. If I always ask them first question, have you guys financed mobile home parks? Are you looking to finance more? And if either one of those are, uh, or yeah, we have, but eh, I already know that they're not the right person because their appetite isn't there. And it's the same thing here on the attorneys. You've got to get somebody who understands it. Yeah, we've actually used land trusts um, to do some subject to financing on mobile home parks and commercial real estate before. So very, very, very doable. Um, like Chris said, use a use a good attorney. So if if I'm talking to a seller and they say, well, wait a minute, I got to stay on that loan. How do you get them comfortable with that? Again, it's usually a different avatar than the owner financing. It's usually someone that when you listened, they had a problem that needed to be solved. Like we did one recently where a couple owned this property and they were not uh, an amicable divorce. Very, very, you know, they're disputing what everything. They were behind two months and they're in separate states. So the so we said, okay, so as we as you listen to what can I solve this, the 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 solve was. Hey, we can close on it quickly. We can catch it up. It's only four grand. And and you guys can go on your merry way. Never did they go, well, 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 what do you mean it stays in my name? They said, you can fix that. And oh, by the way, they had credit card debt and we made that part of the deal. We gave them quarterly payment. So just solve what they're wrestling with. That's it. And you, it won't come up. Yeah, I think it really fits the motivated seller yeah. profile, yeah, right? Awesome. You're not going to get the free and clear guy. Well, I guess you wouldn't be talking about subject two with free and clear, but yeah. you know, you wouldn't be getting someone who's in a really strong position to do subject two financing in a lot of cases because they care about their credit. They care about the that downside risk where when someone just wants out, they want out. <laughs> Whatever it takes, solve yeah. my problem. And that's exactly what you're saying is find the motivated I, seller, right? Yeah, I have found in some states, like Michigan comes to mind, but the, there are several states that when we call sellers, they automatically go, oh, you mean contract for deed or land contract? Like they're used to it and they'll, they're will they more prone to do that for whatever reason. Texas big time because you can't do lease purchase up there. They're just used to sub twos. So just yeah. some states are more prone to be open to it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Where you're investing is going to determine the strategies that you're using the most and whether it's a contract for deed or, you know, just a straight subject to with a deed transfer over, you know, it's it's really going to be market specific and and law specific for those states. So Chris, number one, who should get in contact with you and how do they get in contact with you to do more? Um I, we can give a, a free book link to everybody, but who should do it? Um Look, if you're exploring in any shape, form, or fashion, you said it earlier, Mario, you're always looking for like, where, how can I get that edge? You're always trying to learn. Well, our stuff's creative financing in general. It's I, I The book I wrote is called Real Estate on Your Terms. That's all it means is creative financing. And so if you want to add sort of some power and some skill set to any asset you're doing, then take a peek at what we're doing. Go to wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash Mario, numeric number one. Wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash Mario, the number one. Uh, you won't get asked for a credit card for shipping, nothing. We'll get you out some couple of our books and it'll open your eyes and it'll add to, not change what you're doing right now. 
Yeah, thanks for doing that for the listeners here. He's he's yeah. guys, just so you know, he's giving you a promo code so that you don't have to pay for the books because you're listening to the show. So thank you for doing that, Chris. Yeah. I've read his books. They're phenomenal and uh, I highly recommend them. So definitely take take them up on that. And Chris, I appreciate you coming back. This has been fun. I'd like to do some more things with you specifically around the creative financing strategies within our coaching group and other things. So thanks again, guys. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening. I hope you got out of this as much as I did. I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so we can reach more people. Jump over to mariodatillo.net and find out what else I got going on. Be sure to connect with me on all the socials and I'll see you on next week's show.